The Newton Public Schools are presenting their fiscal year 2025 budget to the school committee. The focus was on special education and related services and adding 22.6 full-time employees to help alleviate the influx in needed special services. There is a public hearing regarding the budget scheduled for Monday, April 1st at 6 p.m. Good evening, everyone. Um, I will get us started tonight with a quick overview of what the Teaching and Learning Department has been working on this year. Um, so content-specific curriculum coordinators along with the ELL department, we are focused on the instructional core, which really thinks about the interplay and the relationship between content, teachers, and students. And we are taking a look at these three key levers of professional development, curriculum, and instruction, and thinking about how CRI, culturally responsive instruction, as well as sheltered English immersion practices and strategies are embedded throughout all of our learning experiences for all students to ensure on-ramps and to maintain high expectations for learning. This slide will look familiar to you. Um, Dr. Nolan talked about the major changes to teaching and learning last week. So I have this here for reference. Um, on the next slide, I will detail some of the major changes, but I wanted to leave this up here so that um, you can understand how these changes though will follow through and impact and be able to ensure that the curriculum we offer in the Newton Public Schools is standards aligned, engaging, and meaningful for all students, including students with disabilities, as well as multilingual learners. This is a slide that details some of the major changes. So we had several on the previous slide, but I wanted to bring your attention to just four of them. We have $3.9 million in additional funding for curricular resources this school year, where $2 million came from the city and it was earmarked toward the elementary literacy curriculum um, with the purchase of a high quality instructional materials and professional learning. So that professional learning was geared toward um, resources for both students and teachers to become more familiar with the particular curriculum and the rationale for why we chose that. Um, and then we have $1 million uh, from DESI, which is a grant for high quality instructional materials. We will, uh, use this money by the end of June to purchase additional trade books to support the literacy program and uh, digital and print resources. $925,000 uh, for district-wide instructional curriculum materials. We are still in the process of determining how those funds will be used. However, some of the items that have been up for discussion is the middle school science curriculum for grades six through eight with Open Syed will be purchasing that for the coming school year and it'll be rolled out over three years. We have uh, the investment in math, particularly for ST math in the K through five setting. And then we also have been discussing expanding Newzella, which is offered currently in the middle school, but it was funded fully in six through eight in the previous year, but because of budget cuts last year, we had to um, scale back on that. And so we are in conversations about expanding that back up to grade 12. There are other items up for discussion and we will be in conversations with various stakeholders to make sure that we have full coverage for K through 12, leveraging those funds. You might recall last week, Dr. Nolan talked about the EL literacy implementation Thank you, Rishi. For grades three through five, next year we will be fully rolling that out for grade five. Grade five was supposed to have rolled out this year, but due to unforeseen circumstances, it has been pushed off till next year. So again, we are in conversations about grade five, particularly given the fact that we want to ensure that teachers' time is balanced and um, we don't want to overburden them with three through five EL literacy implementation, as well as social studies grade five. So we will revisit that, but we wanted to bring that to your attention. And then uh, another one of the major changes is related to the implementation of math and ELA benchmarking for K through eight. We currently use um, iReady for ELA 
We are in conversations about expanding that to include math. We're also looking at some other programs as well, again, so that we can better gauge how students are doing, so that we can manage our interventions, inter I'm sorry, effectively, and to also strengthen our tier one instruction. And then finally, we have an addition of one staff leader in the ELL department who will be focused on ELD development for curriculum and instruction. While at the same time, we're also going to be focused on expanding our SEI practices district wide to again, ensure that all students needs are being addressed. This is my final slide, but here I know the print is very small, but what I wanted to outline here is to show you that for literacy three through five, which is the light purple, we have the full implementation next year, 24-25. And then if you continue to go down and you see science, full implementation is for grades six through eight, not three through five, so we don't have a conflict there. But social studies, this would need to be updated again because we were supposed to implement those units this year, but they have been postponed to next year. So we do have that conflict in grade five for literacy as well as social studies. And if you just continue to go down, you'll see that there is no other implementation of content in the K through five or six through eight that overlaps. And then if you just follow that same thought process for the subsequent years, you'll see that we wanted to really ensure that you would not have that overlap. So in 25, 26, you see there's a full implementation of K through two for science. And then if you go down a bit more, this is for middle school social studies. So I just wanted to give you a sense of how to read this timeline, just so that everyone is aware that we wanted to be sure that there is no overlap again, so that we're able to better manage teachers' time and energy. So we will present tonight the budget implications for the next school year um, out of student services. And before I get started, I just wanna let the folks know um, to, that we're forecasting for the community that um, we will be providing an update actually um, on student services along with CPAC when they present our end of year report towards the end of the school year. So stay tuned for that. Next slide, please, Kathleen. Melissa's doing it. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks, Melissa. Um, all right, so I'll start tonight's um, presentation just quickly with an overview of the major departments. Most folks think that student services of special education, um, we special education certainly falls under the office, but we also have student supports, which includes all su supports to all students within Newton Public Schools. This includes mental health supports, guidance and school counseling, social emotional learning, and then in partnership with elementary education and teaching and learning is multi-tiered systems of support. So I wanted to just remind folks that we not, are not just a special education over here in OSS. Next slide, please. So this here is an overview of all the staffing changes um, that our office will implement next school year. Um, you'll notice that unlike last year, there are no cuts being made, but rather an additional 22.6 FTEs being added to the student services budget. We've separated them out here to just explain a bit more in terms of how these FTEs are broken out. Um, so for those of you who have not gone through um, a budgeting cycle or um, or who have gone through a few budgeting cycles or are familiar with special education in particular, you'll know that the uh, budgeting for student services, in particular special ed, is um, pretty volatile. Um, volatile in the sense that there's a, a level of unpredictability um, and, and certainly the ability to change at any time depending um, on student needs. We're very lucky to have a team of folks who understand the volata volatility of budgeting within student services, um, especially those who have seen the history of revenue that comes in from the state and then of course the expenditure trends um, specific to our district so we have a pretty good idea of the the swing if you will throughout the year um, and for those of you who are not as familiar with budgeting much of it as I mentioned is about special education there's a lot of 
movement at any snapshot in time during the year. Because of the individualized nature of special education, changes are happening really uh, every day. Um, we have students who come in with um, needs that require staffing changes. We have students who are leaving programs or leaving our district. And for those students um, who are receiving services that require staffing, then that frees up some staffing for us. So we have actually some pretty intricate systems in place that capture all of these micro and macro moments so that when it comes to budget planning time, it actually allows for us to be pretty targeted and strategic um, about how we budget and where we put our FTEs. Um, an example of this is the expansion of the Reflections program over at Williams. And so what we do is that we look at the students who are aging out, those who we know who are moving, um, those who no longer qualify for um, special education, and we see who has an FTE attached to that student that we can now redeploy elsewhere without adding to the budget um, unnecessarily so. This way of budgeting allows us to be pretty precise, actually. Um, it's, I think it's pretty responsible budgeting while also meeting the needs of all the students. Um, to that end, though, we know that we have to prepare for the unknown. So you'll see here in the top row an estimated need uh, for FTEs for next year is about 10. So we are putting 10 FTEs on hold. So we're holding 10 FTEs for unknown enrollment needs, um, such as new students moving in with implications for additional staffing. The second row here is what we've been able to add um, thanks to the stabilization funding. So here you have a total of 10.4 FTE, uh, which includes the addition of the social workers at the elementary level um, and the additional staffing that's required to continue to operate the newly opened um, in January NECP classroom. The last row here uh, will actually be discussed in more detail in subsequent slides, um, but it's a 2.2 FTE add um, as a result of some of that, that trading, um, the, the sort of horse trading that I discussed um, earlier. Next slide, please. So we'll go into um, special education and we'll start with our youngest learners and move our way up. Um, so I will pass it on to um, Kathleen. Great, thank you. Um, so the early childhood program now, most of you have been through there or multiple times. So um, I've always appreciated the visits. Um, we are currently sitting right now at our enrollment of 215 students with 130 students on IEPs. <clears throat> um, there are many students in the middle of evaluations right now. Um, this is just a few numbers up there. Um, we have 40 on, in process currently. 154 have been completed to date for all phone calls last week. Um, and three students moving in from other districts. So just last week. So, um, so they are on their way. Um, for future planning, I always like the, the information from early intervention. So um, of the 426 cases at early intervention, so that's um, Riverside Early Intervention, Birth to Free, which covers Newton, Needham, Weston, and Wellesley. We still can get a few cases from the Thome, uh, Thome Early Intervention in Waltham, um, but not as many. Um, but 211 of those cases reside in Newton, so that's students from zero all the way to almost three. So more than or approximately half of their program falls for, um, for Newton. Um, during, um, and as you know, during the 23-24 school years, just this past January, we opened um, our 14th classroom. Um, currently right now for seven slots, um, four, in general, four, almost five are um, enrolled. So I believe I'm uh, a little anxious about the end of the school year, but we'll get there. So this is just a slide of our current numbers and it goes back for the year, uh, two years prior. Um, one of the things I always point out is the number of students who are placed out of district at the preschool level, because it's rare. Um, we are able to um, have the majority of the students be in our um, program because we have so many um, skilled professionals at NECP and throughout, um, obviously, the district. Um, so that's one of the things that's really wonderful about NECP. On the top line, I am projecting 180 students this year. So last year was 170. I am projecting 180 given all the evaluations we're in the middle of right now and all of the calls that we're currently receiving. A lot of the calls we're getting right now are parents who are starting to panic about kindergarten and are calling and saying, my school is telling us to call because my child needs an IV. Um, and 
that's a, a process that we talk CP is just the trends that we've been seeing. This is a similar slide to when I was here last November presenting. Um, we are really finding that these are still the students that were born during the pandemic or right after um, my 2021 students right now are ones that were born just as vaccinations were starting to happen. So um, they are, these students are just different in their presentation. They are um, having a harder time being out of their homes, um, separating from family members. Um, just this uh, decreased school readiness, more dysregulation is what we're seeing for the little ones right now. Um, and we are really um, trying to um, look at the profiles of the students that we have coming in and change our service delivery accordingly based on cohorts and what we're seeing as um, trends, doing that internally with um, the resources that we have. One trend that I am seeing right now, which does have me um, concerned for next year, is we have had a significant number of students who have been enrolled in our STRIDE program. Um, and right now, starting next school year, we have two STRIDE classrooms at NECP. Both will have seven students in them. And Department of um, Elementary and Secondary Education regulations at the preschool level is a cap of nine. So that only leaves four openings in stride for next school year, which is concerning. Um, so that's some of the uh, uh, trends that, that I am seeing. I'm happy to talk a little bit about what's happening in elementary school for special education in our 15 schools. So you'll see here, similar to last year's, um, we've looked at trends over three years. Um, and as we look at that, we see that we've uh, got a fair amount of stability with a small uptick, 22-23. And um, right now we're at 787. That may have changed since the date that I made this slide. In fact, I'm positive it did, given meetings happened today. And last week, that's that ever-changing volatility that uh, Casey mentioned. And um, when we made the slide, there were 103 students under evaluation at that time. So you might know that once a parent consents to an evaluation, we have 45 days to complete that evaluation. So we were in that 45-day window for 103 students um, at that time. For students placed out of district at the elementary level, um, that's fairly stable over um, a number of years, including these three years. Um, and although we see uh, a lot of complexity with students, we have been able to support them in district um, and value students who are able to remain, to remain in district. So to be responsive to the needs um, for all learners at the elementary level, we spend end of winter, beginning of spring, doing a look at each of the elementary schools, talking with principals and teams about what staffing patterns would be most supportive of their building for the following year. And we are, um, our goal for that is to ensure that students are supported and that we have the right uh, staff in place. Part of that review is looking at uh, citywide programs, not just the elementary school neighborhood students that are enrolled based on their address. And we have, um, in my partnership with Kathleen, um, I know that there are a number of students leaving NECP, moving their way up to kindergarten, which is very exciting, but they need the level of support that Reflections offers. So we have a pretty good cohort um, moving up. And so we will need to expand the Reflections program at Williams, which we're um, excited to be able to do and to welcome those families into in-district supported programming. With that, we have in my partnership with Melissa, we know that there are a number of fifth graders moving up um, to middle school in the STRIDE program. It's fewer than the incoming K students that are coming, and that's allowed us to uh, drop one of the classrooms at Bowen. So we'll have just one remaining classroom at Bowen because our cohorts are not um, balanced between incoming K and outgoing fifth grade. That's again, just using our staffing um, appropriately. I also have the great fortune of spending a lot of time talking about buildings, which is very exciting um, in partnership with um, some of our friends at City Hall, Josh Morse and company. We um, meet very often, Emily knows, um, around all these school builds. And so um, we have a couple of citywide programs that will be able to move into really lovely, appropriate spaces for them moving forward. So as we plan for a new Franklin school, we will be moving the bridge program from Pierce to Franklin with newly designed spaces. 
The SPARC program already is at Countryside and, and um, will remain there again with space that we've been able to customize for them. And then at the Lincoln Elliott School, when um, they are opening up, which is earlier, uh, the earliest open, we will have the REACH program. And for people who have been here a while might remember the REACH program, but I can explain. Um, it's a program that we discontinued for a period of time because of space issues. But now that we'll have space, Lincoln Elliott will have REACH, which supports students with language-based learning disabilities. There's, of course, the uh, Horace Mann Elementary School, who's not receiving a citywide program, but also um, I participate on all of those meetings with architects, and we will have appropriate spaces for students with disabilities in that school as well that reside in the neighborhood. That's a really enjoyable part of our work together. So at the secondary and post-secondary level, um, we're looking at the middle school numbers at the top. And as you will see, they have remained mostly consistent over time. Um, there was a drop going into the 22-23 school year. And then right now it's settling in at 478. There are still kids um, who are being evaluated as we speak in all four of the middle schools. But there, it has remained stable. At the high school, we've seen a slight uptick over the years um, from 660 in the 21-22 school year to 726 in the 22-23 school year to 735 so far this year. Um, still kids being evaluated as we speak. Um, the number will go up some. Um, if you look at our out-of-district numbers, the middle school has remained pretty consistent. Um, we're down a little bit from last year, which is good because we we were up a little bit last year from the 21-22 school year. And right now, um, the numbers for the high school out-of-district are down slightly. Um, I expect that they'll be about the same that they were last year. Um, so a lot of the decisions I have made with Casey and with the rest of the directors is preparing um, for students moving into some of our programs, specifically at Oak Hill, they have the language-based program A cohort and B cohort. Um, that will be increasing um, next year. Um, it'll be somewhere in the mid 40s, if not higher, they're still doing transition meetings right now, and we don't know where the final number will end. Brown Middle School, as Maura spoke about, we have a cohort of fifth grades coming up, which will increase the program from 13 to about 18. So we would like an increase in the special ed teacher that is currently there. Um, and then with all of that, with more kids going into programs, there is a need to increase just slightly our um, some of our related services for OT and PT in order to support the kids specifically at the middle school. And then finally, there is an increase for a school psychologist at Newton South. They currently have 2.2. Um, this would ingre uh, increase them to a 3.0. Again, looking at the programs and the kids moving up, this is all based on the enrollment and the number of students that will be coming to Newton South. 